All right. Welcome back to another episode of the WellBe Show and Podcast. Uh, this is your host, Adrian Nolan Smith. I am thrilled to have Maya Dusenberry, a journalist and the author of the book Doing Harm, a book about gender bias in medicine, with me today. I think this is going to be a fascinating interview about topics that are so important to my work as a holistic patient advocate and to, I think, all of you, anybody with a body, but especially women. Maya, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. The topics that you shed light on in your book are a real wake-up call. So if you don't mind, could you just explain a little bit about how you came to write this book? Was it you know, personal experience, professional, um, mm -hmm. and just the process of, of doing that and kind of, you know, what you learned. We'll talk a lot more about what you learned uh, more specifically, but just as an introduction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a kind of combination of personal and professional interests. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis about seven years ago, and that was really the first time that I had much reason to interact with mainstream medicine. You know, I had been really helped healthy up until that point. And so I really just hadn't thought that much about how well-equipped medicine was to care for me if I were actually sick. And that was despite being a feminist writer who had re was really interested in women's health and had written a lot about reproductive health issues. But it wasn't really until that that I sort of started to broaden my lens um, to think about you know, all the other ways beyond just reproductive health issues that sexism can affect women's health care. And like I said, since I was auto, uh, diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, part of my interest just stemmed from getting really interested in learning about autoimmune diseases. So being yeah, kind of perplexed about why it is that we don't know so much about autoimmune diseases, why so many autoimmune patients seem to have these long diagnostic delays and really struggle to find people in mainstream medicine that take their symptoms seriously. And that was actually not my experience. I was diagnosed pretty quickly, but it was hearing other women's stories that sort of got me interested in figuring out why it is that those kind of stories seem to be so common for a lot of women. Got it. Okay. So um, you had this experience yourself. And then as you started to just, you know, go down the path of writing this book, it's a very sensitive topic, obviously. There are people that, uh, you know, are in the medical profession or that, really hold it in such high regard, almost like a worship E and worship er type uh, situation that they maybe took some offense to this, or um, you might've had some naysayers or, you know, generally, did you have any negative response to the things that you were talking about? Um, yeah, you know, I actually haven't had that much um, negative response. For the most part, I've been really happy when the book came out. I think a lot of the response was just from patients and, and women who really saw their own experience reflected in it and found it really validating for that reason. Um, I also got a really good response from a lot of people working within medicine, um, especially um, female physicians and healthcare providers who have really been, you know, working on these issues and kind of see them from from the inside um, and we're eager to see, you know, a, a book that kind of spoke to a lay audience talking about them. Certainly, I think mm, the feedback I get is tends to be from like a self-selected <laughs> group of people who, you know, have enough of an interest or openness to the topic that they pick up the book. One of my hopes is that, you know, as more conversations about this topic happen in the media and in medical schools and in other realms um, that it will, you know, reach beyond just kind of preaching to the choir and, and get some of those people who may have a knee jerk reaction uh, against it. But I think, you know, I do, I feel confident that once you sort of look at the, the data and the research, um, you know, that it's pretty undeniable that there's a problem here. <laughs> Yeah, so I was going to say, what is the major problem that you found? So you obviously had a hypothesis going into this book uh, that there was a bias against women or in, you know, a gender bias in medicine and healthcare. And we're talking mostly about conventional healthcare, right? Not the natural holistic side. Yeah. Um, and what did you find? Was that confirmed or did you find more once you started, you know, doing the research for the book? Yeah, I um, I did. I was really surprised by a lot of what I found. Yeah, I came into it as a feminist writer who was, you know, not not surprised to to find that medicine is yet another realm where, where women aren't treated quite as equally as men. Um, but you know, the two big problems that I identified in the book um, 
are number one, the knowledge gap. So we just don't have as much knowledge about women's bodies and symptoms and conditions that disproportionately affect women compared to men. And that's really a legacy of many decades when women were left out of a lot of clinical research altogether or underrepresented many decades and, and still today, women's health issues are you know not really top of the research agenda. So there are a lot of conditions that are really poorly understood that affect lots of women. And then the second big issue that I talk about is what I call the trust gap. So uh, this tendency to dismiss women's symptoms, um, particularly for you know sort of subjective symptoms like pain or fatigue that you can't objectively measure with a test or a scan. Um, and you really have to trust the patient's own self-report of what they're feeling in their body. And so many women have stories of, you know, being told it's just stress or anxiety or, you know, having their symptoms minimized or normalized um, in various ways. And I, in the book, I really trace that tendency to this history of hysteria um, that has been a part of medicine since its inception and, and really I think is alive and well today, even though we don't you know, have a diagnosis called hysteria, um, there's still that sort of tendency to attribute symptoms that aren't readily explained to uh, the patient's psychology. And I think that definitely disproportionately affects women. Yes, uh, I have read lots about the history of hysteria and you know, mental illness, and even just today, how women are called crazy, you know, that's a common way to describe um, a woman who is a lot of different things. That's a part that's so interesting to me. It's not mm -hmm. that it's uh, one thing that's related to their poor mental health. It can be a variety of things in just the way that they're acting, if they're being a bully or they're being um, dramatic or they're whatever, it's all crazy. And so, and crazy, unfortunately, is um, our colloquial term for mentally ill. And so I think this perception persists that there's this misunderstood amount of mental illness in all women that men are just not going to go towards and understand. And therefore, uh, let's just call it hysteria um, and put this blanket term on it that means nothing. And then, of course, it uh, trickles down into a medical distrust of their ability to understand their own symptoms. And mm -hmm. in I think in addition to that, the conventional healthcare tendency to trust tests above all really makes that worse, right? So if a conventional doctor runs a blood test and doesn't find anything, a lot of them will say, nothing's wrong with you. Right. They trust the test above the person. What's different or interesting about functional medicine doctors now and the difference in how they practice taking a lot more time with patients and talking about symptoms first before running any blood work, they are one going to have a very different blood panel, right? They're not just taking just a CBC uh, typical blood test. They're going to be looking for things that are related to the symptoms being described. And then also if they don't find, you know, anything related to the symptoms that were described on the initial testing that they did, they go to different tests or they treat based on the symptoms being described, mm -hmm. um, which I think closes that trust gap. Um, and so it, it, it benefits women a lot more. I think if every doctor took both the person's symptoms and explanation of what's been going on with what they're finding in conventional testing, um, we'd be a lot better <laughs> off, but that's just generally not how it is. So I think that that's really interesting. Those two things I see all the time in my work. So how can people who aren't journalists or authors or patient advocates um, shed light on these topics in their everyday lives or hold productive conversations with people who may not be aware or may be misinformed or, or skeptical that this issue really exists and hasn't looked at the data or hasn't been able to read your book yet um, to see that it does? Um, because I think when everybody's more aware, meaning men and women, this issue becomes smaller. But when it's only, like you said, people who are self-selecting into this topic or um, interested in this topic or who have experienced it, it will probably continue to persist. Yeah, I mean, I think I feel very optimistic about the power of um, women's stories really helping to shift things in this regard. You know, I think when my book came out a couple of years ago, it was one of a sort of wave of memoirs by women who were talking about similar, you know, problems in medicine and their own diagnostic journeys. And I think we really have in recent years seen a lot more um, 
people sharing in media or on social media about their experiences in medicine and, and with illness, um, sharing in ways that, you know, maybe prior generations just weren't as comfortable with. And I think that that has really helped one show other women that they're not alone, which I think is of course a really powerful thing because I heard over and over again in my interviews with women that, you know, they would have these terrible experiences and felt really dismissed. Um, and it was very easy though, when they were just looking at their own, you know, individual single experience to say, you know, well, maybe it was just me, or maybe that was just one bad apple, or maybe I could have done something to advocate for myself better. And so I think it's really helpful to kind of see other people's stories, um, to have that moment of realization that, you know, it's not about you, it's, it's not your fault. Um, and this really is a, a systemic problem that affects a lot of people. And I think also for healthcare providers, you know, I think that one of the big things I talk about in my book is that because mainstream medicine really lacks a good feedback system to, to let doctors know when they've made a diagnostic error, a lot of doctors assume that they're getting it right, you know, and they don't hear the stories of women who have gone to five doctors and been told it was stress um, and then finally got the right diagnosis. And so I think that that's one of the big ways that this problem becomes really kind of self-perpetuating. And I think that's also one of the reasons that these kind of stories can help kind of spur healthcare providers to think about their prior experiences with patients and, and sort of question, you know, was that patient that I was, you know, convinced was just a hypochondriac actually, you know, undiagnosed patient that maybe got treatment from somebody else and I just didn't hear about it. That's such a great point because, you know, I film and tell a lot of stories of health recovery through um, integrative or, or functional medicine. And um, you're right. It's absolutely true that they very rarely go back to any of the doctors who told them, you know, ridiculous things as far mm -hmm. as how wrong they were, that they were in fact, you know, given a proper diagnosis and then healed that thing that say, they said they couldn't heal or whatever it was. Um, they just move on because they're, you know, obviously they don't want to go back to that. It was traumatic in some way and they have to move forward. But I think if those medical prof professionals actually heard the stories of how they were able to reverse things or, um, you know, that they found somebody who actually, you know, believed them that they might start to take things like that more into consideration, but because they never hear about it, they don't give it a second thought. They keep practicing in that way that did not enable them to figure out or help that patient um, right. that ended up, you know, in your book or being filmed by me. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's such a great suggestion. So anybody listening that's had a bad situation, um, get on the phone or write a review even. I mean, it's actually kind of amazing. Health grades, ZocDoc, a lot of these uh, online services actually allow you to write reviews about doctors. I mean, don't say anything that's not true or, you know, not helpful to other people, but, um, or over, overly nasty. I've seen some overly nasty reviews, but you know what I'm saying? You can write it that way. If you don't want to have a actual interaction, you can write their staff an email that will hopefully get to them. There's a lot of different ways. So I think that's a great suggestion. I want to talk about gaslighting. So gaslighting is something that I cover and have talked about quite a bit at Wellbe, um, but I'd love, since you're much more of an expert on it than I am, if you could give a brief explanation about what it is and maybe just some high-level statistics that you learned about it through writing your book and also how it kind of came about, you know, what are the root causes of it and how it's affecting people today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the medical context, what I would call medical gaslighting is, you know, a healthcare provider encountering a, a patient who's reporting symptoms and, and, you know, running tests and coming up with nothing and saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with you or, um, you know, minimizing those symptoms, you know, calling them just sort of the, you know, daily aches and pains of normal living or just stress because you're a, you know, overworked mother or just, you know, normal menstrual pain as opposed to, you know, really severe pelvic pain that needs to be investigated. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's many ways that women tend to be gaslit, but I do think that one, you know, big way is, is this kind of psychologizing of symptoms and, and saying it's, it's stress or depression or anxiety. And I think for a lot of women, that's, you know, really confusing <laughs> to encounter that when you're reporting physical symptoms and 
one of the things that became very clear in my research kind of tracing the the medical history as i mentioned is is that this concept of hysteria has been a kind of a part of medicine for a really long time and so you know back in ancient Greek times, it was this disorder that was thought to be caused by a wandering womb roving about the body. And then in Victorian times, it was kind of shifted to be seen as a nervous system disorder. And then in the 20th century, there was a final shift to seeing it as a psychological problem. So, you know, physical symptoms called caused by a mental illness. And I think that that is really a big reason that women specifically so often encounter this kind of medical gaslighting. And I think, you know, when patients aren't being told, you know, it's just stress or, you know, giving a sort of loose diagnosis of depression that doesn't really make sense, you know, there's, you know, terms like functional or medically unexplained symptoms that are all sort of terms that just mean that these are symptoms that we don't have observable cause for. Um, So in other words, they're just symptoms that medicine has yet to fully explain. Um, And I think that the big problem is that medicine has for so long sort of treated unexplained symptoms as women in women as adequately explained by their psychology. And so they haven't done the investigation to actually figure out what the root causes are. And so I think that, you know, not only does this hurt individual women on when they go into the doctor's office often, but it's also created this real problematic catch 22 where a lot of syndromes that affect women disproportionately have been really neglected in the research realm because they're assumed to be psychosomatic. So things like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, um, vulvodynia, a lot of, of these really quite common disorders have gotten very few research dollars and really have remained very marginalized within mainstream medicine. I would argue largely because they're, you know, unexplained symptoms that (laughs) affect women and are just seen as all in your head. Yeah, it's so interesting and tricky because you mentioned a few, you know, like depression, anxiety, right? In our in our modern conventional system, um, that's actually a condition. Whereas a lot of more holistic doctors would say that's a symptom of something, right? There's right. some something is dysregulated, and one of the symptoms is fatigue, depression, anxiety, et cetera. So what we know through the microbiome project, which is so interesting, is that you know there's actually a bi-directional communication between your gut and your brain. Mm-hmm. And so um, you, they used to think that your brain could send your gut messages, right? Um, and that's like, if you were nervous to make a speech, your stomach might hurt or you, you know, something like nervous stomach. Um, but now they know all the microbes in your gut are actually sending messages to your brain and traveling to your brain and all that stuff too. So um, really, affecting and contributing to mood disorders and other um, psychological, you know, conditions or symptoms really. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when you also throw hormones into the mix, and especially because medicine was always so male dominated and they didn't understand all the reproductive hormones, you know, the menstrual cycle and how much they change throughout the month for women, it's almost like lazy medicine, right? And you talk a little bit about that in your book. It's a whole nother dimension of, of a human body that's thrown in that men are like, okay, it was hard enough to figure <laughs> out the connection between, you know, illness and symptoms. Like that's hard enough or the root cause, right? Um, now you're throwing in constantly changing hormones for this particular body that's not mine. So I also don't feel as inclined to study it because it doesn't affect me as much as it affects this person in front of me. And we know that these changes also have hormonal changes, which have mental changes because often hormones contribute to mood. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's because of the gut connection, we now know because the gut affects hormones so much um, and the gut mood connection is so strong. So um, it's very complicated and it's always in flux. And I can see how this kind of lazy medicine evolved because it's much easier to say you're crazy or it's not real than it is to understand how all of these intricate organs and systems connect, I think, right? Or can you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I do think to some extent, you know, so back in the early 90s, when this problem first kind of came on the public's radar, um, you know, there were congressional hearings about it and lawmakers, you know, saying, look, like, women are not being represented in this taxpayer funded research the NIH is funding. Um, a lot of really big foundational clinical studies that had happened in the 80s 
were done on just thousands of men and no women with really no justification for that beyond, you know, that, um, you know, they, there was an assumption that beyond our reproductive organs, it was fine to just kind of study men and extrapolate and apply those results to women. But I do think one of the less sort of acknowledged reasons was that it was just, it was harder and more complicated. There was the sense that women's hormones made them a more heterogeneous group of subjects um, and that it would be much easier to have an all male study population. Um, but of course, you know, that, that excuse sort of underscores exactly why <laughs> women need to be included. If you're acknowledging that your results might be changed and might be more complicated. Um, if you include women, that's, you know, <laughs> acknowledging that it's really important for, you know, a study that's potentially studying a drug that's going to be prescribed to women. Um, right. It's actually, almost like they don't want to know about or find out about all the adverse reactions, right? Because <laughs> it's easier to get things through and on the market with less or to keep right. the trial going. Um, and I think like what you were saying, you're acknowledging that the female body is much more complicated because of this additional reproductive um, hormonal piece. And so, of course, men have hormones too. I mean, we all have hormones, but right. this additional reproductive piece that then causes these hormonal changes that are monthly would probably create more adverse reactions to a drug and therefore mm -hmm. cause more problems. And they yeah. just, you know, don't want to deal with that. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of funny. And I liked your phrase that you use lazy medicine, because I hadn't heard that before. And it's pretty <laughs> applicable. So you told a lot of stories in your book, and obviously I want people to grab your book and read them um, if this topic interests them, but could you just share some of the ones that were sort of your, I don't want to say most shocking or um, interesting to you or that surprised you, but just, you know, some that you, that really stood out to you? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I collected a lot of stories and I think probably the, the most sort of impactful for me, it was just to see, you know, how similar a lot of them were. And as I said, how, how many women seemed to think it was just them, you know, and, until they had reason to kind of hear other people's stories and, and start to realize that it was bigger than them. One story that was very, very kind of dramatically illustrated the, the trust gap and that medical gaslighting problem. A woman named Maggie, who was a young college student who suddenly had severe abdominal pain that took her into the ER. At first, they treated her as if she was probably having an, a panic attack because um, she was a young, healthy college student. After tests came back normal, she was discharged, um, but the pain came back even worse. And over the course of basically a weekend, she kept coming back into the ER um, as they increasingly sort of shifted from seeing her as this anxious young woman to potentially somebody who was just drug seeking and looking for narcotics. And so by the time she was in there for the third time, they really had stopped trusting her report of pain uh, entirely and really thought she was just making it up. And it wasn't until they started finally getting, you know, objective testing results back that showed that something was really very wrong that they took her seriously. So they, they finally did another scan that showed that she had a perforated organ somewhere in her ab abdomen. And, you know, she really described very well how that one result really just like switched a flip, you know, and, and suddenly all the nurses were very sympathetic and doctors who had been ignoring her for 72 hours were rushing her into exploratory surgery. Um, she ended up having a ulcer that had, had perforated, which was, you know, a very rare diagnosis. And so, you know, that was sort of their justification for not catching it, but, you know, the problem was that, you know, not only had they not reached the diagnosis quickly, they had not continued to believe her when she was complaining of really severe pain and it had, you know, almost cost her her life. Wow. That one's pretty uh, shocking and amazing. Were most of the stories related to pain that was not being acknowledged or what were generally the themes that you saw? Um, I think that was a big theme. You know, I think pain is the number one reason people go to the doctors, but I think, you know, there were other stories of other symptoms that are subjective. You know, I think that this, that's when it becomes really dangerous for women. If you are complaining of something like pain or fatigue or something that can't be measured objectively, I think that that's where there's a lot of danger, but there is women complaining of 
fatigue and kidney infections that turned out to be from lupus, but it took her, you know, 10 years to be diagnosed. She was a black woman and kept being told that she was drug seeking and that it was just depression. And, um, and so it really took, yeah, literally 10 years for somebody to kind of put all the pieces together and see that, you know, the, the fatigue and these kidney problems and all of these, the joint pain that all of it kind of fit together into <laughs> Uh, diagnosis and um, yeah so I think it was a you know a range of problems but I do think that pain is certainly something that is such a you know it's just so hard to communicate to another person even in the best of times and then you you bring in all of the stereotypes and and tendency to kind of see women as as overly emotional in response to pain and um, you know I think one of the big problems, especially regarding pain that I, I noticed is that there's this kind of double bind that women are in. So if you are trying to articulate how severe your pain is, but you don't want to come across as, you know, just a hysterical woman that's overly emotional, like a lot of women then take the opposite route and try to sort of be really super stoic. Um, but that can obviously backfire because then you're basically downplaying your pain, right? <laughs> so then people might think, well, there's nothing wrong. You know, if she were really in pain, she would be crying or, or you know, being more dramatic about it. Um, and so I think it, it is very difficult. You know, I had one doc a doctor actually, who's also a patient advocate say, you know, it's very hard for a doctor or for a woman in a doctor's office to um, report her symptoms because if she's crying, she's hysterical, and if she's stoic, then there's nothing wrong. And I think that that's something that a lot yeah. of women yeah. really realize when they try to walk that line and figure out how best to advocate for themselves. And what I've also seen is that a lot of women aren't advocating for themselves with themselves too. So uh, this cultural perception that you just spoke of even is you know, indoctrinated into women about their own body. So sometimes I have seen in my own life or other stories I've told or, or clients that they've sort of reasoned away constant or chronic pain that they've had or chronic fatigue or assume that they are somehow to blame for uh, both of those things. You know, like I, well, I just haven't been sleeping well. I think it's just been too hot or I've been I'm worried about that thing. So as soon as I can get my, you know, sleep a little bit better, then I won't have this fatigue or like, of course, we're all tired or, you know, something like that, always trying to play it down to themselves to try to not seem whiny or dramatic or weak. And I think same with pain. I mean, I've, I've had a scoliosis and a bunch of different uh, pain issues for, you know, over 20 years. And even when talking about it, I am already reasoning to myself, I can handle it you know, it's not that bad. Sometimes it gets better. Um, you know, a lot of people who must have much worse pain than me, you know, it, it can't, it's not that bad compared to other people. So, um, you know, I'm even playing it down to myself before I yeah. describe it to any sort of doctor or practitioner. So it's really interesting how we're doing this to ourselves uh, as well, um, because our whole culture has kind of taught us to think about ourselves that way as well. Mm -hmm. So it really perforates down to even your relationship with mm -hmm. your own body. You know, we're coming up on the end of our interview, but we haven't even started to talk about what do you do? What are we going to do about this? First of all, have you seen since your book was published um, or since, you know, this has been a little bit more of a mainstream conversation? I know there was like a long article in the Atlantic about gaslighting uh, a couple of years ago. Have you seen any changes in the conventional healthcare system that are showing signs of improvement in this problem? Yeah, you know, I, I do think it does feel like there's there's been progress, you know, as I mentioned, I, I think that there in the last few years have been a lot more books written and articles written about this topic, you know, including just in the last year, a couple by healthcare providers who, you know, have a sort of insider's look and are calling for really, really big systemic changes, which I think is really wonderful. And so, yeah, I, I do feel hopeful that as, as more people talk about it, both inside and outside of, of the medical system, there will be progress made. And I, and I think, you know, for me, it's my book focuses a lot on just kind of laying out the problems and, and not as much on sort of the solutions. But I do think that there, you know, our solutions are acquired on just like so many different levels. Um, so there's, 
you know, obviously there's not one thing that will kind of be the silver bullet that fixes it all. Um, but that means that there are lots of different places you could start. And so, you know, there has the movement on, you know, ensuring that women um, and female animals are included in studies funded by the NIH. Um, just in you know the last several years, there's been more of a focus on that. There have been efforts to get the sort of knowledge that we do have about sex and gender differences that we've been accumulating for the last few decades, get that better integrated into medical education, which is one of the other big problems is just that, you know, because there's such a big lag time between when we study something and when it's actually being taught to doctors and their training, a lot of doctors are still kind of just learning outdated information. And so there are benefits. Yeah. I just talked about this with somebody. I think it's 17 years for clinical research to trickle into yeah. medical education or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's especially hard. Time. Think about what you were doing 17 <laughs> years ago. Exactly. And, you know, and, and, you know, as advocates working on this say, you know, it's especially hard when they're really calling for a sort of overhaul to the entire curriculum. You know, these are not just like adding, you know, one standalone you know, class on women's health or something, it's really kind of integrating this acknowledgement and recognition that there are potential differences um, between the genders and um, through all of all of the <laughs> clinical areas. And so it is a big, a big lift, but I think it, you know, is what needs to happen. The other big thing that I think would change things a lot is, as I said, the getting better feedback mechanisms so that doctors are aware of diagnostic error would be huge. And and there are definitely efforts within medicine to kind of think more about diagnostic error in general, to um, raise awareness that it's a problem and that it's a problem that the average physician doesn't realize is such a big problem. You know, there's a tendency to think that it's, you know, only other doctors make mistakes. It's not, it's not me. Um, and so I'm, I'm heartened by efforts by folks like the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine that um, are working on that issue because I think it's an issue that will obviously help all patients, but I think will especially help women who continue to be harmed so much by diagnostic errors. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so we talked a lot about the sort of subjective, uh, you know, things like fatigue or pain, um, but what can women really be on the lookout for when going into a healthcare situation to make sure that they're not the victim of um, this bias or misdiagnosis or, um, or even being, you know, the, the victim of medical error because of gender bias. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, things like drug adverse reactions where women's bodies haven't been nearly studied enough um, before that drug was approved by the FDA and put on the market. Part of that is gender bias, but that's just going to be called a freak adverse reaction. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and same with surgical errors, because women are not uh, studied as far as surgeons in medical schools, women's bodies, the way that certainly not in the numbers that men's bodies are, and then other kinds of procedures as well. So um, I know you mentioned, you know, misdiagnosis and, and not being uh, taken seriously with regard to pain and fatigue, but are there other parts of it that women should really be on high alert um, <laughs> where there are major issues? Yeah, I mean, I think you should be on high alert <laughs> always. Yeah, I think one of the big issues is, as you said, you know, it, it would it is important for women to be aware of this sort of knowledge gap and to be aware that it's quite possible that the the, the drug or treatment that you're being prescribed has not been adequately studied in women. And so asking your provider, you know, has this been studied in women? You know, is it appropriate for me? Um, they might not know, which in, is then just a way that we can kind of apply pressure on the system <laughs> kind of from the bottom up to, to kind of spur them to, to think about it more, which I think is, you know, yeah, one way that, that women advocating for themselves can actually kind of help <laughs> them. They can be advocates for changing the whole system by sort of raising awareness to their own providers that this is, you know, something that they need to be more on top of. But I think in describing your symptoms, you know, I think I would just always recommend being, you know, very um, aware of the fact that there is this tendency to dismiss women's symptoms. And so to try to kind of make them as concrete as possible. So when you're, you know, if you're experiencing fatigue, don't just say how it makes you feel, but sort of say how it is functionally impairing your life. So, you know, not just like, I'm so exhausted, but like, I can't, you know, do the laundry because I 
you know, need to lie down or something to make it a little bit more concrete and real and hard to deny. The other big thing is I think just not taking nothing's wrong as an adequate answer if you're still experiencing symptoms. You know, as you said, it is so common. And I think that so many patients, perhaps especially women are too quick to kind of accept that, you know, which I mean, makes sense. You know, we have a lot of sort of cultural respect for medical professionals. Um, you know, it's hard to trust. Revering your- the white coat. Exactly. Someone you told have- me once it has like all the trappings of religion, you know, the, the right. little costume, like the, you know, the priest has the robe and then the doctor has the white coat, even when they're not practicing in a way that would require a white coat, right? right. It's for surgeries or something like that, right? And the esteemed medical degree on the wall behind basically saying like, you have to trust me because I've got these exactly. hallowed institutions saying that you do. And, you know, this very, uh, and often because it was a, a you know, a, a male doctor too. So there was this sense mm-hmm. of like deferential, you know, you had to be deferential to them. So it is very interesting, uh, the sort of the connection between the, you know, the revering of the doctor and the taking um, a diagnosis of basically, we don't know, or you're crazy Mm -hmm. um, as like, oh, okay, I must be crazy, or this isn't real. (laughs) I think I would like to think that if I were in that position, you know, I would, I would not, you know, accept that I would advocate for myself. And I think, one of the things I want women to really understand is that it is really hard. You know, there is this huge power differential when an expert is telling you this and you, you know, don't have all the information that they do, but you do know what's happening in your own body. It is really easy to start sort of second guessing yourself and to, as you say, think, you know, maybe, maybe it's that my pain isn't as bad, you know, maybe this is just stress. Um, and I heard that from so many women and so, yeah, I think we need to acknowledge that that is, that is hard, but that that is what we need to do and, and bring a little bit more sort of um, healthy skepticism to these professionals who have been given so much trust and realize that, you know, you can always get a second opinion, hopefully. Um, oh, yes. I always tell people get, get three or four, however many you're willing to do or can afford because right. Um, you'll sometimes get wildly different answers based on the opinions that you get. So two can be not nearly enough to take an average of, you know, you, I would want always three because two could be very different. And then a third could kind of tell you, okay, this one agreed with that one. So maybe that's more of what it is. And also I always tell people to get opinions from different kinds of professionals, right? So you have a back pain issue. Don't go to three back surgeons, you know, go to a chiropractor, go to a back specialist, uh, back surgery specialist, maybe if you're considering surgery. Um, and then maybe also like an, you know, orthopedist, you know, some other kind of person that's not looking at you from the surgery perspective or mm-hmm. from the chiropractic perspective, um, because you might see very different things and you just get such a better sense of all the options instead of like, you either need surgery or nothing's wrong with you, mm-hmm. um, you know? So um, I think that's all such great advice and so interesting. Um, I have so many things in my own life and stories that I've told where the things that you're talking about were so real. And, uh, you know, it just reminds me that pretty much nothing is in your head. I mean, if something is happening to you physically, even if a contributing factor was stress, for example, or some sort of mental trauma, It's the mental trauma or the stress that's exacerbating probably, you know, your microbiota or your gut lining or something like that to then exhibit these physical symptoms. But it's not like stress alone works to cause pain or something like that, you know. So um, I would really urge people listening to this to always err on the side of, of course, I'm not imagining it. If I'm feeling it, it's happening, you know, and to not second guess themselves in that way, or just think that everything is stress. Stress is a contributing factor to so many problems in our body, right? but it doesn't act alone. You know, I I think of it like a, you know, it pushes something else out and then that starts a reaction, whatever that is, whether it's pain or fatigue, et cetera. So yeah, this topic is so interesting to me. I could just talk about it with you (laughs) forever. All right. So those are some great tips for what women should do or anybody else experiencing any kind of bias um, in the conventional healthcare system. My last question for you is, 
how do you get wealthy? So um, every guest I have on this show, you know, usually they're experts in the medical field, but yours is a little bit different. And I consider you an expert in this part of medicine, which is very important, even if it's not a gastroenterologist or something like that. But how do you really take care of yourself um, day to day so that you don't end up in a healthcare situation where you could be gaslit or misdiagnosed or not taken seriously. So if you wouldn't mind saying how I get well is, and these are just like your can't miss wellness practices that without them, you just don't feel right. Ever since I was diagnosed with RA, I've been in remission, which has been really great. And um, that is not yeah. an easy feat. That is amazing. <laughs> And yeah, I do read it to a lot of um, the kind of holistic approaches that I took. Um, so how I get well be is I eat really good nourishing food um, and cook a lot. And I move a lot every day. I've been going on long walks, especially during the pandemic. And I try to really prioritize my sleep. And that's a little bit harder, but <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah, those three are great. Um, the basics really are what yeah. they are um, <laughs> for repairing, right? Sleep, movement is really detoxification and so many other benefits. And then food is the foundation of, you know, a healthy gut and giving our body all the right inputs and, you know, hopefully none or few of the wrong inputs mm -hmm. um, so that it can really function at its best. And hopefully it means you never have end up in a bad healthcare situation and none of the things that you've learned will be important. <laughs> Obviously, you know, you'll still have annual uh, physicals and things like that, where it will be useful. But the fact that you've put your RA into remission um, is so impressive. And um, thank you for sharing all of the information that you have learned through the book, Doing Harm. I hope anybody that's interested in this topic will pick up a copy. I will link to it on the article page on getwellby.com and also for coming on the show today and talking about this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. <laughs>